Yeah, we're, we're getting started. We haven't quite started yet, so it might get quiet, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear us. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Maya Nye, and I am the Executive Director of People Concerned About Chemical Safety, and I want to thank all of you for being here uh, on the roadmap planning team to look at what it would look like to uh, develop a roadmap to prevent uh, chemical releases here in the valley. And um, as you can see, there are a number of cameras here. This, this process will be videoed. This, it will be recorded. This is a meeting that is open to the public. Um, so just so you know that that will be happening throughout the, throughout the meeting and through June. And so what brings us here today is, uh, is really to look at, again, some of the uh, recommendations that were made by the United States Chemical Safety Board in the aftermath of the 2008 Bayer Crop Science Explosion. And what the recommendation was is to look at preventing, or to uh, implement a chemical release prevention program here in the Valley. So that's why we're here. And the purpose of this team is to look at what would that look like here in the Valley? And what are the steps that we need to take to implement that? So that's the reason why we're here. This isn't, the, the purpose of this meeting is not to dwell on the past, it's to use the past as a tool for moving forward for what does our future look like here in the Valley. And so some of the things that we'll be answering today uh, will be clarifying the role of the committee in the development of the roadmap. We're gonna come to some agreements about how we'll work together and work to kind of build trust amongst the people who are here. Um, We'll look at identifying goals for roadmap completion. We'll develop a calendar of meetings. We will identify additional stakeholders that need to be engaged in this process because it's obvious that not everybody is here at the table today. We will also identify some additional planning team members to join us in the effort to, um, to develop this roadmap. And then we will identify some of the assets we have, some of the resources that we have and some of the additional resources that we need to complete our path. And then we will also identify um, next steps. You'll see that I have a list over here called the parking lot, because there are a lot of things that we're not gonna get to today. We, you know, these meetings are supposed to happen from now until June. Really today is kind of a nuts and bolts meeting, and um, anything that is sort of burning that's on your mind that you really want to talk about and make sure that we think about or move through, we're going to put it on the parking lot and we'll bring the parking lot with us at every meeting so that we have, um, so we can save it for another day. <laughs> All right. So let's get to some introductions. Um, does anybody want to start? I'm Lacey McClung. I'm the Deputy Cabinet Secretary at the Department of Environmental Protection. And, and I'm sorry, when you go through your introduction, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? So your affiliation, you work with the, the DEP, you're the, the Cabinet Secretary. Can you tell us about your background and some of your areas of expertise and what actually brings you to the table today? Bob <laughs> <laughs> Um Yeah, I've been with the agency 20 years. Actually, it was 20 years in February. Um, I started with the AIR program. I actually have a uh, engineering degree, mechanical engineering degree. Um, started with the air program and spent probably 10 years working in the permitting section and moved up and then became director of the Division of Water for a while and then moved into the executive office. So pretty much done a little bit of everything at the office. Hi, good morning. I'm Lysandra Wright. I'm the environmental health director here at Canal Charleston Health Department. Um, a little about my background, I have a chemistry degree from the Ohio State University, master's in public health, um, was an active participant in the response role to the chemical release, chemical school we had back in January. I'm looking forward to being very involved in this roadmap mission to bring a lot to the table in terms of how to move forward. Hi, I'm Pam Nixon, I'm the citizen representative on the committee. I have a bachelor's degree from West Virginia University, West Virginia State University. 
a master's degree in environmental science from West Virginia Graduate College. Um, I've worked earlier in my careers. I was a medical technologist at area hospitals here in Charleston. And um, then I was a environmental advocate with the West Virginia EPM and Hi, I'm Tony Turner. I'm with the Office of Environmental Services, Bureau of Public Health. Shadow, I'm the director of radiation, toxics, and disorder and conservation for the Office of Environmental Services. Been in public health for 35 years. Started out in the local health department. Worked there for 16 years. The rest of my time is in the transcript and conservation. Uh, worked with two weeks of dealing with health assessment and a variety of diseases. I'm Walt Ivey. I'm the uh, director of the Office of Environmental Health Services. Office in the Bureau for Public Health. Um, I'm a civil engineer by uh, training, and uh, most of my experience with the health department has been with the drinking water program. Uh, I've been with the state health department about 15 years now. I'm CW Sigmund. I'm the Deputy Director of Emergency Management for Kanawha County. In my background, I spent over 40 years, we won't get into the exact years, over 40 years in fire protection. I do have a master's degree in safety with uh, emphasis on industrial hygiene from Marshall University. And what brings me to the table is information sharing. Uh, as an employee of the county, uh, we want to sh share information, but I bring it right now to everybody's attention that any political action or legislative action required, that will have to go through my commission, you know, for me to take any stand on that, that position. But uh, for right now, it's just information sharing. And just to clarify, that, that is what this, this Bill Presser. I teach uh, chemical technology at the Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. Uh, I was born a chemical engineer and got interested in environmental issues in 1965. And so that interest brought me to the Kanawha Valley in 1974 to teach at the West Virginia Graduate College that, that Pam mentioned. And so I spent 27 years teaching engineers, biologists, geologists, and, and chemists how to apply the knowledge they had to the pollution control issues at their company or at their agency, and uh, then retired. And uh, now I'm training chemical plant operators, for which there is great need at the bridge. And what brings you to the table today? Hmm? And what brings you to the table today? What brings me to the table today? An invitation from Maya. Um, I, I've been very interested in the balance between jobs and environmental protection. And in Boston, I was told, make up your mind. You're going to be a chemical engineer, get rid of those hip boots. You're going to muck around in the environment that you can't do chemical engineering, and I'm saying no, both. And the job here was one of those few jobs in the world at the time that was both. And I had people sitting in my class. The head of the Citizens Action Group, next to the guy that ran the South Charleston Power Plant. And maybe outside of class, they fought in the newspaper. But in class, our focus is on how can we better understand what's going on so we can do a better job. And uh, then by the 90s, everything got polarized. And if I helped this side a little bit, I was an enemy of that side. I don't know. I'm, I'm just wanting to see how things can work. Thank you for saying that, because I feel like that, that is part of the purpose of this committee, is to really look at how we can work across differences to look forward to our future. So thank you for thank saying you. that. And Dr. Mike McCulley, you can't see it, but you're actually next in line. So if you would introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. um, my name, as I said, is Maya Nye. I'm the Executive Director of People Concerned About Chemical Safety. And um, my background is Primarily as a resident of this valley, I grew up about a mile away from what is now the Bayer Crop Science Institute facility and um, have experienced a number of chemical releases over the years. 
all of the schools that I attended as a child were within um, the fence line zone or vulnerability zone of chemical facilities here in the Valley. So my interest, what brings me to the table, is looking at, we've had some incidents in the past, and what I would like to look at is how we can look forward to the future to minimize the risk here in our valley. So that, that is my goal, and my goal is also to bring people together um, who are representing all of the aspects of this, um, particular, who have multiple interests in this. So, um, so that's who I am, and that's what brings me to the table. So, in working together, um, I really thought that it might be nice to kind of lay, lay the, the, the groundwork for that. Um, so, what we've uh, lined out here is that each voice here is important in this conversation, and it's necessary towards meeting our goals. And everyone in this room is acknowledged as an expert in their field and has been invited to participate as such. If you can just be mindful about the amount of time that you take in the conversation to ensure that all of the voices are being heard. And we're here to commit to the task. And our task is to develop a roadmap for implementing a chemical release prevention program here in the Valley. Are there any other items that should be on this list? summarized it well. <laughs> well, I will say that um, I'm working from two different computers here, so I'm just using. Another thing I think could be helpful, it's not on the list, is speaking from experience. I think sometimes that's helpful um, in situations when we come from different experiences, just to speak from your experience, right? Um, and also, acronyms. Um, I, I put a list up here. <laughs> We like to throw out acronyms in meetings like this, but not everybody is always on the same page with that. So as, as we move through this meeting, we will, uh, we will uh, line it out up here or any sort of vocabulary that needs to be acceptable to the layman as we're moving through this. What we're doing is asking everyone to, um, to identify who they are, their affiliation, their background, and what brings them to the table. Could you go ahead and do that for us? Sure. This is Mike McCauley. I'm with West Virginia University with the School of Public Health. I'm the interim chair of the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, my background is 27 years with CDC NIOSH, uh, during which time I also taught in civil and environmental engineering here at WVU. And uh, only in the last uh, six years have I been uh, associated with the School of Public Health. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in biology master's degree in environmental engineering and a PhD in environmental health. Um, I'm here because I'm interested in all of the environmental health issues in the state of West Virginia, representing as I do the, the university and, uh, and in particular the School of Public Health uh, on these issues. Uh, I'm also a member of the Governor's Commission on the Water Research Study and so um, I have been uh, working on research associated with both air and water issues uh, for a number of years now. Great, thank you, Mike. What we're actually gonna do now, you have a copy. We're just gonna run through the agenda of what we're gonna go through for the remainder of our time. So if you wanna take a look at that. Sure. And I'm gonna try to move closer to you. Um, okay, so we've already gone through the for the first part of this, but uh, after this, what we're going to do is um, an overview of what the Chemical Safety Board recommendations are. Uh, look at, uh, and, and it's primarily from the 2008 Bayer Crop Science incident, look at the open recommendations, the closed recommendations, talk about who the Chemical Safety Board is, and, um, and, and look at the details of that recommendation. And then we're gonna do a breakout. And it seems like um, as we develop a program, there are some models that we can look at, but I think what's gonna be important is looking at you know, what, what are some of the specific reasons why we want this program here for the Valley. So we're gonna identify some of those things. We'll break down into small groups to talk about that. And then we'll come back to the table, we'll take a break. And um, 
Then when we come back, we're going to look at some next steps. And that will be identifying perhaps some areas of focus, um, some additional planning team members, an additional um, uh, who are our stakeholders, who needs to be engaged in this process as we move forward. We're going to look at uh, what we're going to identify some of the resources that we have available to us and then some of the resources that are needed moving forward and look at if we want to have any kind of assignments outside of this meeting. I know that we committed to a meeting a month, but uh, so we'll look at that and then um, identify any needs that we have for the next meeting. We'll go over um, a calendar of what and hopefully identify what the calendar for the from now until June will look like and then we'll invite any members of the public to give any input that they may have and then we'll close out and uh, as you'll see there are some surveys in your packets and I'm going to ask you to complete those before you leave and identify some plans for the next meeting. Are there any questions? All right. We're going to look next at the Chemical Safety Board. Oh, wait, the roadmap goals. That's what we're going to look at. <laughs> so the goals for the roadmap are to enhance the prevention of incidental chemical releases and optimize responses in the event of their occurrences. Two is to mitigate factors that have the potential to degrade human health and the environment. And three, develop a pilot project in the Kanawha Valley that what I would like to consider as we think about it, we're, the purpose is to identify it here for the valley, but is this something that could be helpful across the state? Qu question. Yes. On the pilot project, are we stuck on, is the group stuck on the, exactly what the recommendation was from the Chemical Safety Board, and, and I emphasize the recommendation, or is this a uh, open to discussion and open for variation of a pilot project. Uh, if it's going to be only to, um, try to put my words right here, if it's only going to be to go follow exactly the chemical safety board or is it finding some way to enhance safety, where, where we get stand, are we make it, are we making our own model or are we just strictly trying to figure out a way to do what the chemical safety board said? Well, they didn't give us the model. Well, in, in a way they did. They identified some, some things to take a look at, yeah. but but I think that that's what, that's what we're here to okay. do, is to look at what would that look like and how does it, what does it mean to us here in the Valley? Because our needs are different from other places. Yeah, and, and no, and sometimes in a, in a report, did not specify exactly the model system, but in all of our meetings with them, and all of our meetings we had with them, they referred back to one in particular model. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I never was in a meeting with them any time that they didn't refer to this one particular model. Which is the Contra Costa Contra County. Costa. And, and it, it is, if you look at it, it's not a perfect system. No, it's not a perfect system. I don't think that there are any perfect systems out there, and I think that we're not going to create a perfect system. From my <coughs> perspective, I don't think that we are. But, but the hope in being here at the table together is to look at how it can be better. That's all. And so, yeah, I think, it's a, I think we're developing that. Yeah, and I also think we need to look at it, look at their report and it's, it's uh, dwell on the positive. A lot of good things come out from the incidents in 2008 and other incidents. We've enhanced uh, response to it, not the, necessarily the, uh, the mitigation part of it, but the response <coughs> has been enhanced greatly. I think we need to make sure we, we include that. There's a lot of mitigating factors in there to make the situations a whole lot, whole lot less of a burden. Absolutely. And I would, I would welcome those comments. You know, if you want to take a, you know, a bit of time at a meeting to, to help line those things out, let's do that. Okay. I feel like this, this team, we're a team, so we're putting this thing together. All right, Bill. Yeah, in 1993, we did the worst case scenarios here and then was adopted by the rest of the country. So I could see us being open to look at possibilities here mm -hmm. that maybe they didn't mention, the Chemical Safety Board didn't mention that would be good to the rest of the state and possibly the rest of the country. Yeah, I know, Pam, you were actually quite instrumental in that, I believe. Right, and, and I was on the Kanawha Putnam Emergency Planning Committee and worked closely with the EPA and, and with um, industry to, to come up with the way to roll out our risk management plans from here in the Valley. Right. So I think we have there, I think there are a lot of, we have a lot of things to pull from here. Mm -hmm. um, so. 
Are there any other questions about the goals of the roadmap? Um, the activities of the program, this is, uh, so to convene these meetings, so CRPP, that's my first acronym, and that's the Chemical Release Prevention Program. Um, and, and just looking at it, the Chemical Safety Board recommended a hazardous chemical release prevention program at CW. And what I've, in thinking about the January 9th event, that was not a highly hazardous facility. So I'm suggesting we move forward and calling it the Chemical Release Prevention Program because highly hazardous facilities may not be the only things that we need to think about moving forward. And I know a number of the people at the table that were, you know, uh, responding to an incident recently. So, um, so to convene these meetings, we'll collect and we'll utilize the public input that we receive. I mean, so there are voices at the table, then there are voices outside of this that are equally as important to this process. Um, and in this process, it will work to educate other sectors and best practices that we can adopt here to prevent chemical releases. We'll draft a, uh, a roadmap and we'll, we'll put it out for public input and then after analyzing that input we'll have a final roadmap that's that's the purpose that's the intent that's what this planning team is uh, supposed to help achieve and I think this is some, this is guidance this is helpful guidance. If there are other things that you feel like need to be included in this, let's, let's include it. Um, but I think that a successful roadmap would outline the program structure. And this is all in your packet, by the way. Um, can I use this on this piece of paper? Yeah, it's all, it's all listed here. So it uh, would be the program structure, the definition of covered chemical facilities and characteristics, program uh, processes, how does the program work? How is it organized? What are the roles and responsibilities within the program? We'll look at a timeline. You know, is this something that would be implemented all of a sudden, all at once, across the valley, or does it need to happen in phases? A fee system that is self-sustaining uh, that and, and that comes in from the Contra Costa County model that you mentioned, CW, is that that is one way that that program works, but I think that's something that this committee absolutely, it's essential that we address. Look at what some of the applicable laws are that, we, that would need to be, that would be directly uh, connected to this program, and then identify any sort of changes that would need to occur to carry that out. All right. Are there any questions about this? Okay, any comments? Okay. Timeline, today <laughs> through June. That's, that's the goal of this, is to have this completed by June. Now, whether or not that is realistic, I think that you know, we'll need to assess that. We'll feel it out, but that's the goal, and it would be really great if we could achieve All right, now let's talk about, I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page with the Chemical Safety Board, who they are, and just sort of look at um, sort of one of the things that brought about us being here today. Okay. So who is the Chemical Safety Board? What are the recommendations and the status, and what are some of the details of the recommendations? The United States Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, otherwise known as the CSB, which is on our list, makes recommendations based on the findings and conclusions of its investigations. Recommendations are made to parties that can affect change to prevent future incidents, which may include the companies involved, industry organizations responsible for developing good practice guidelines, regulatory bodies, and or organizations that have the ability to broadly communicate lessons learned from the incident, such as trade associations and labor unions. The 
the recommendation that we are looking at today comes specifically from the 2008, the August 28, 2008 incident that occurred at the Bayer Crop Science Facility and Institute. There was a pesticide chemical runaway <coughs> reaction and a pressure vessel explosion. There were two worker fatalities, Barry Withrow and Bill Oxley. There were eight, according to the Chemical Safety Board recommendations, there were eight emergency responders that were injured. CWD, was it, were they all emergency responders? I believe that that was yes. what that number yeah. was from. And I put this extra bullet point at the bottom. It's not in the report, but I would like to indicate that community fatalities and injuries were not really documented in that process from my understanding in some of the, in some of the, um, what some people have told me. None were reported to us. Right. Right. There were none that were reported Correct. or have been reported um, or sort of within the system. And, and the monitors weren't working, so we couldn't surmise what might have happened. Right. But I, I'm just going by people requesting assistance and saying, <coughs> help me, help me, I need an ambulance. Right. No documentation on that. Docu the only documentation we have of off-site uh, consequences was a... Uh, a storm door, I believe, of a house is probably pretty close to the, on the St. Albans side of the river. Right. Uh, there's no other documentation of actually uh, damage off-site. Well, there, there was. I remember video footage from, I think it was the Oliver Fuel Station right across the river where the windows were knocked out. Yeah, that's, that, there's, 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 a, there's a home on the river bank close to that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty close to that. Right. And, and when I say this, um, I'm saying that people have said to me, that there were two fatalities that resulted, two community fatalities that resulted from this, but there's no, I, I'm putting that out there because I feel like it's something that needs to be part of the conversation because we talked about it during the January 9th incident as far as making sure that things were documented. Um, so this is not this is not any sort of, look at, you didn't do your job, that's not what the, the point of bringing that up is. It's just to let you know that people have said this to me and I feel like it's a valuable part of this conversation. There were 13 recommendations that were made in response to that incident, nine of which are closed, four are still open, one of which that we have really no jurisdiction over, and then two that are the same, so we'll just go through the details of that. And you also have this in your packet, everybody here does. Um, so the closed recommendations, and um, a number of the Particular recommendations were made specifically to Bayer and Institute. There's one uh, from the KPEPC, that should also be up there, um, that's closed. The West Virginia Fire Commission one was made to them. Two to OSHA and one to the EPA that is no longer applicable, as well as one to OSHA that's no longer applicable. Uh -huh. But the open ones, the reason, the reason that we're here is to look at the one that's open, which is to establish a hazardous chemical release prevention program. And if you look at it, this is, this is part of what our roadmap goals are, to enhance the prevention of accidental, they call it accidental, I call it incidental, releases of highly hazardous chemicals and optimize responses in the event of their occurrences. And in establishing this program, study and evaluate the possible applicability of, of the experience of similar programs in the country, such as those summarized in the report. I do not have a copy of the report for you today. I see that you brought yours with you. <laughs> um, it is available online. It's a, hefty, it's a hefty piece. I can send you a link to it. If anybody needs a paper copy, um, please let me know and I can get one to you. But if you're able to access it on your own, that would be preferable. You attached it to your email. It is, thank you, yes. There's one acronym that just went by. Okay. Um, and then, so this recommendation was made specifically to the Director of Cornell Charleston Health Department, uh, and then the Department of Environmental Protection and Department of Hu Health and Human Resources were charged with assisting in the implementation of that program, which is one of the reasons why we have a broad representation here uh, today. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so let's get into 
the nitty gritty of the recommendations. I'm actually going to write down here. write down what that is later, but everybody knows Kanawha Charleston, Kanawha Putnam Emergency Planning Committee, that CW Sigmund is actually also representing them today. So again, the recommendation, establish a hazardous chemical release prevention program to enhance the prevention of accidental releases of highly hazardous chemicals and optimize responses in the event of their occurrence, and then establishing the program, study and evaluate the possible applicability of the experiences of similar programs in the country, such as those summarized in the report. And the ones that are summarized in the report, for those of you who have it, are the Contra Costa County Industrial Safety Ordinance out of California, and also looking at the New Jersey Toxic Catastrophic Prevention Act. And those are just two suggested ones to look at. <clears throat> this is all in your packet. Um, and the recommendation goes on to say, ensure that the new program implements an effective system of independent oversight and other services to enhance the prevention of accidental, excuse me, releases of highly hazardous chemicals, facilitates the collaboration of multiple <coughs> stakeholders, which we're trying to do here today, in achieving common goals of chemical safety, and increases the confidence of the community, the workforce, and the local authorities in the ability of the facility owners to prevent and respond to accidental releases of highly hazardous chemicals. B, define the characteristics of the chemical facilities that would be covered by the new program, such as the hazards and the potential risks of their chemicals and processes, their quantities, and similar relevant factors which within the context of this, I mean, really looking at the January 9th incident, I think that it's important that we learn some of the lessons from that experience and perhaps apply it to this process. Written safety plans with appropriate descriptions of hazard controls, safety culture, and human factors programs with employee participation and consideration of the adoption of inherently safer systems to reduce risks three emergency response plans, and four performance indicators addressing the prevention of chemical incidents. D, ensure that the program has the right to evaluate the documents submitted by the covered facilities and to require modifications as necessary. Ensure that the program has right of entry to covered facilities and access to requisite information to conduct periodic audits of safety systems and investigations of chemical releases. Establish a safety of fees assessed on covered facilities sufficient to cover the oversight and related services to be provided to the facilities, including necessary technical and administrative personnel, and consistent with applicable law ensure that the program provides reasonable public participation with the program staff in review of facility programs and to act and access to the materials submitted by covered facilities such as hazard evaluations safety plans emergency response plans the reviews conducted by program staff and the modifications triggered by those reviews records the audits and incident investigations conducted by the program, performance indicator reports and data submitted by the facilities, and other relevant information concerning the hazards and the control methods overseen by the program. And the last is to ensure that the program will require a periodic review of the designated agency activities and issue a periodic public report of its activities and recommended action. So it's kind of hefty, you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us and uh, we have to figure out how to break that down in a way that works for us. Uh, Maya? Yes. It's Mike. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Kelly. Um, and I have been able to hear you now. Great. Mute works really well. <laughs> awesome. Great. Um, so as not to have to reinvent the wheel, 
Uh, let me point out that the European Union has something called the Water Framework Directive for kind of identifying um, or giving you a, a road map for identifying where your potential problems might be. And, and so they have worked this out over about the last 10 years and, and put a lot of thought, a lot of energy, and a lot of expertise into it. And it's available now, and they're putting it basically into practice starting in 2015. So I would suggest that we take a very close look at how they're doing things uh, so as not to have to discover this from, from the get-go on. What was the name of the model? Can you uh, re repeat the name of the model again? The European Union Water Framework Directive. And this was, I believe, first proposed in about 2000. Excellent. Thank you. I, just to carry over with the recommendation, I, I just wanted to follow this up with saying that this recommendation carried over when we had the incident at DuPont in 2010. Um, there, was, there were three incidents. There was one fatality one worker fatality, Carl Banny Fish. Um, we lost him in that incident. And I'm sorry, but I don't know the number that were injured in that incident. Um, the recommendation, the Chemical Safety Board recommended it again, um, not a formal recommendation, but in an op-ed in 2011. And then we know that the Chemical Safety Board is, is, has been investigating the January 9th event. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome is and if this is a recommendation that is carried forward. So just as more context as to, to why uh, the framework is important. Are, are there any questions, comments? I, I really appreciated Dr. McCauley's comment on the additional model to consider. I think that's helpful. Does anyone else have any other specific models or ideas that you think we should look at? A, a rain check on that to be able to come back next time. We'll Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. No, please. This is a participatory. If, if I'm I, not going to develop the room. If I may share something similar to what you talked about on, in the European, uh, over, the last, over this year we've been meeting with the, the FEMA folks over uh, the incident management system, and one of the pieces of it is a model we, we proposed to FEMA was out of Europe. I think it was uh, it's called STAC, the abbreviation was STAC, S-T-A-C. It's Scientific Advisory Sale for, a, for an event. For example, uh, the, the Elk River chemical spill, we had uh, guidance from several different le levels of government, from feds down to local, uh, how toxic the material was and when the water was safe to drink, et cetera. And what they've done over there is they brought, they brought experts in as a group and to come to a consensus and speak as one voice. And these, these folks, whoever they may be, answer to the incident commander of a particular incident and advise that commander directly. They don't go through any filters or anything. They're like a safety officer or any other command level officer. But they have direct access to the incident commander and speak as one. So the, we're trying to model a system into our incident management systems here in the United States kind of based upon what the, the Europeans are doing also. Did you say, I heard STAC? It's S-T-A-C, Scientific, Scientific Technical Advisory Sales, something like that. I have, I have, I have all the data at home because okay. I was on the committee that submitted that to FEMA. Okay, uh, you can bring that so we can Yeah, there, there's some good data on that from, from that group. Okay. Yeah, if you can One of the uh, uh, aspects of this uh, Water Framework Directive is that they go in uh, prior any spill so that it's um, you have a database to work from and actually define the toxicity of all chemicals being used so they, they review what chemicals are uh, applicable and and then they they review the toxicity and where they have an unknown in fact they impanel uh, a group of toxicologists to review it and they have procedures for for reviewing the toxicity would that be similar to what 
the new legislation for the uh, water tank storage bill to where we're supposed to list all the uh, chemical facilities, particularly in the zone of critical concern. You know, we're supposed to identify through DEP. Uh, yeah. the, so it, it sounds like it's similar, except for maybe the analysis part of it. Yeah, that, that's right. <coughs> All right. So I want to, um, you know, we're not going to get into a whole lot of scientific detail today. That's sort of the meat of this, and that's really exciting. But I, one of the things that I would like to do next is I'd like to break out. And when I say that, we have sort of a, a group of people, maybe we can cluster in, in two different groups and talk about, um, talk about some of these questions. But I'd like to know, why do we want to prevent chemical releases? What, I mean, it seems like a very basic question, but I think it's a good one to ask and to talk about. What have been the effects of chemical releases in our valley? And what are the benefits of preventing chemical releases? So, and the reason why I ask that is to look at maybe what, what are some of the things that we value about this program? Why, why are we considering this program and moving it forward? I'm gonna leave this slide up here. I'm not sure what will happen when that comes. I don't know. Um, We're going to have a break. Well, well, obviously, you guys looked at the contra contract. Pretty cohesive group. And with even the, the, the unknowns we had at the airport, as a group, we all worked together pretty well. So. Have yours completed? I do. I'll tell you what, I'm going to, we're writing them down on post its and we're going to put them on the paper here on the wall. So, what are your top three? Why, why do you want to prevent chemical releases? Yeah, I, I took this as not just me, but as a society in general. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the first thing that you could say under all three categories, you could just put the word economics down, uh, because all of this, every every question involves economics to some extent, um, both uh, in terms of the the lives it affects and the cost to society of affecting those lives, and then the cost to the state of the reputation uh, that it gives us. Uh, so if we're attempting to attract um, people to the state, if we're attempting to attract industries to the state, and by that, really people as well, um, having a, a poor structure uh, to safeguard those people is uh, counterproductive. Uh, then we come down to what the, the, the moral issue in all of this and environmental justice and, and who's most likely to be affected, the people who can't move away. Uh, so we, we have some portion of the population that has an economically captive portion and they're going to be the ones who are likely to suffer the greatest consequences. And, and finally, um, it just it doesn't make sense to not do something when, in fact, we have blueprints available to us uh, that we can follow. Okay, so that's your top three for all of those, all of the questions, or just question number one? No, that, that's my top three. I, okay. I think it applies to all of those questions, okay. really. All right, great. Thank you so much. Which group wants to go next? Thank you. Sure. Um, and, and I want to grab your posters when you're done, so make sure that it's all written down there. So go ahead. Well, we're going to see where we work at anyway real quick. Uh, okay. Well, first of all, it would be like you know, protect human health. Okay. And uh, second one would probably be the, the environment, which could be back and forth. Could you speak up, please? The environment. So, the second one would be the environmental health or the environmental community. Protecting human health and protecting the environmental health. And the economics would be the third one economy because it affects businesses, you loss of income. Pretty well, they, that would run across the gamut of all three questions. The second one would be loss of human life, 
and injuries to workers and the citizen of the valley. Is that going to be con the contamination of the water in the air or the environment? And of course, the effect of how would the <clears throat> affect the infrastructure or the economy? Is that on your post-its there? Pretty much. Is it listed in a way that, that I'll be able to look back on it? And, one, and two, and three. One, two, and three? All right. Excellent. Thank you. If you can read my writing. Uh -oh. Bill, what did your group have to say? Yes. Why do we want to prevent <clears throat> chemical releases? Uh, because of the health impact. Because we want to keep and we want to keep a healthy environment and jobs a win-win. We could have jobs where we could have a healthy environment where we can prevent the releases and then have both. And third, to protect human health and the environment. Great. Take that. Number one. All right. For what have been the effects of chemical releases in the valley, the psychological impact. There's some people still don't drink the water. Some people worry about living near a chemical plant and so forth. Uh, the second is the risk of injury. And the third um, would be, say, the job losses of the restaurant workers and others during the chemical uh, uh, spill into the water system. Right. And the benefits of preventing chemical releases would be to save lives, protect the environment, and the economic issues of uh, the, the hotels are going to do better, the restaurant workers are going to do better, lots of other people will do better if we can prevent the releases. I think that was helpful. I heard a lot of common things amongst those responses. Who are some of the stakeholders in this process? Industry? Yeah, the plant managers. The plant managers specifically. There's two on the list. I don't think I they made it. To stakeholders? Yeah, I don't think they made it today. They were invited to participate as planning team members. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Jim Covington at Bayer declined participation. And um, I also invited Mark Nunley, the director of National yes. Institute for Chemical Studies and who works at Matrix. I invited him to come and participate, but he also respectfully declined. So hopefully they'll, but, but they should be, I hear, I mean, I think that they should be members of the planning team. I think it would be helpful if they were. Well, do we need plant managers from other plants if those people can't make it? So I've also, um, and, and let me also uh, point out that the invitation uh, to Mark went out actually last month, but the invitation to uh, Jim, I had a really difficult time getting in touch with Jim, so the invitation didn't go out until last week to him. And then um, when he declined, I thought that since they they were the the direct uh, recipients of the original or the re, you know the reason for the original chemical safety board recommendation, I thought it would be nicest to invite them first. Um, he declined on Monday, I believe, and then on um, and then I sent an invitation to Jim Covington at Dupont on. Tuesday, I believe it might have been Wednesday. So it's it's it, he hasn't responded. So I I you know that invitation, as far as I'm concerned, is still open. That process would have happened quicker if I was able to get in touch with them um, more easily. Employees, employees, as stakeholders or planning team. Uh, either, either one. You want me to put it on both lists? Yeah, I think they should be on both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So also, let me update you there um, that I contacted the AFL-CIO, um, I think it was at the end of September, and they agreed to find somebody to sit on the planning team, but they've also been, I guess, extremely busy with the elections. So the last I heard was after the elections, so hopefully by the next meeting. So, can I add, I want to add union to this. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just
was talking employees, but I specifically meant also union. Turns out the restaurant uh, people really suffered a lot in the last bill. Small. So some sort of small, small business, business. Small business. Uh, representative that would recognize that kind of problem. So again, let me ask, is this stakeholder and planning team or just stakeholder? You think just as a stakeholder? Yeah. Okay. Unless they say, hey, I really want to be part of the planning team. On the planning team, you might look, you might go above small business and just say you know, business representatives or something like that. Okay. You know, uh, if you've got a commerce group or something. we're looking at, at stakeholder lists and then other people that should be at the table and I uh, and I explained that I had invited Jim Covington from Bayer to attend and he respectfully declined the invitation and I also invited um, and I wasn't able to reach him until last week so I didn't get the invitation out to Jim O'Connor at DuPont until late it was earlier this week and I still haven't heard back from him I also invited um, Mark Nunley, the director of National Institute for Chemical Studies and from Matrix to attend, and he respectfully declined. Well, since you're making the list, do you want to include the people that have come to as well? I mean, the groups that are involved sure. on the planning team? Because that's, sure. I mean, it's going to be your full planning team, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've got the regulatory agencies as well. You've got so, the citizen groups. Yeah, that's the thing. <clears throat> regulatory agencies. And that would be, I get confused between Bureau for Public Health and DHHR. We're part of DHHR. Okay, so I'm going to say DHHR. Yeah. DHHR, DEP, and your local health. And then, formal health. Sorry. <laughs> KCHD. Oh, I should put these on the acronym. I'll put these on the acronym list. Are there other regulatory agencies that? Don't you have OSHA? Yes, um, and also I've, I've reached out to Angela Wilson, who is an industrial hygienist, and she's a consultant for OSHA. She's not able to, at least right now, hoping we can get her to come to the meetings, but right now she wasn't able to attend this meeting and said that she would gladly provide any sort of assistance needed to help this process yeah, along. So she could be on stakeholders. If you look at the process safety management, that's the OSHA thing already. You know, OSHA already has process safety management as part of their regulatory uh, issues. Mm -hmm. right. so they're already doing that to a degree. So they should definitely be involved in the planning. Do you think? Hmm? They should definitely be involved in the in the planning. Yeah, they're, they're already doing. Right. It. Um, are you I mean, in academia? our plan. Academia. Mm -hmm. And actually, Mike, are you back? I'm here. Okay, I'm sorry. What we're doing right now is we're identifying a list of people who should be on the planning team uh, who are not here but also identifying who's here and then um, also looking at other stakeholders that need engaged in this process. So feel free to chime up on any comments. 
Okay, thanks. Have you, have you heard what we've said so far? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so the stakeholders, we have industry and specifically plant managers. We have employees listed, union representation, <coughs> small business representation, and OSHA, uh, especially for their process safety component. Those were the stakeholders. Now for the planning team, we have uh, plant managers from industry, employees, union representatives, business leader, state homeland security, and regulatory agencies, including DHHR, DEP, Canal Charleston Health Department, and OSHA. You might want to see if you can talk NIOSH into being part of this too, since they're right in Morgantown. As part of the planning team? They have a division of safety research there. As part of the planning team? Yeah, I think that's it. what he was saying, you know. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, uh, you bought out on the last part. What I'm saying is NIOSH has a division of safety research in Morgantown. And they should be listed on the planning committee? I, I, I would send them a, an invitation. They may not understand that there's two different lists. Okay. Yeah. And we have so, and, and so I guess other members of the team are saying that we have two different lists. So should they, be, should they be sitting at the table as representatives who are developing this roadmap, or should they be considered stakeholders who are engaged in the process? I think um, they should be helping to plan the roadmap because I think you'd find that they have quite a bit of expertise on, on accidents and accident prevention. Yeah, great expertise. Great, thank you. Somebody else mentioned academia yeah. uh, on the planning right. team? Definitely, yeah. Okay. Which we have, we have some of right so far. Me and Mike. <coughs> Are they also stakeholders in the process? They should be, yes. How are we doing here? The big gaping hole for me right now is citizen, and I heard somebody say that earlier. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to write it. I wonder if the community advisory panels might be a, a easy route to get citizen input. Okay. I mean, maybe there are other ways. That's a good. That's a but good. But you've got two community advisory panels represented here, and if we could take somebody who's not technically involved mm -hmm. and drag them over, then you've got somebody who's not only a citizen. But he sat there for months and months and heard what the other citizens are saying. It, I can report back to my group. I'm not here representing them. Mm -hmm. but I, I, mm -hmm. Well, I think that, that also in, in the development of this list, the, the hope is that we actually engage these people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully the planning team will be helpful and instrumental in engaging these stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, I, I wrote this up here so I wouldn't forget to do it, to add team leaders. So are there, are there planning team members who would like to be considered the leader or the point contact for the state, these stakeholder groups? <coughs> Pam for the citizen. Okay. I think it will be helpful to have people leading, or at least to know who they can connect with to have, if they're not able to make it, this is who they could contact to make sure that their input is expressed in this process. So that is what I would say the team leader of that would, would be instrumental in doing. Do you have somewhere you're gonna collect the information and put it? Yeah, I'm hoping to get it up on our website some point in time. At this point in time, I can email it to whoever. <coughs> so eventually there will be one place just to direct everybody to mm -hmm. back. Do we have anybody else who's willing okay. to sort of serve as the point contact for any of these? 
Bill, are you? I was going to bring up something else. Okay. Um, at the South Charleston Area Community Advisory Panel, we talked about the um, the ethical, moral issues involved in polluting. Mm -hmm. and tried then to get a member of the clergy to be part of the, the mm -hmm. stakeholders there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether, and, and had great difficulty finding somebody. My minister for a while was there, but he's retired. Um, but there's another possible area to say, uh, is there somebody from the religious community that would fit somehow? <coughs> I have a suggestion for that. I know somebody in the clergy who's trained in ethics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you would like to connect with them to see if they would be interested in, in <coughs> helping connect stakeholders? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Hmm. Uh, the person's name is uh, uh, Dan... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of his last name now, but yeah, I will get a hold of him. It'll come to me. Okay. What I would like to do is have names of <coughs> names of our uh, <coughs> team members over here. Within DHHR, when we have an incident that happens, one of the um, groups that gets involved is our behavioral health office. Okay. And it may be worth having them on the state hall. Okay. Because whenever something happens, it becomes a psychological right. problem for behavioral health to become a It doesn't necessarily have to be a guard. And I know Jim he's very active in the community. Mm -hmm. He may be one that you can reach out to to possibly get an input representation of that segment. I had somebody teaching for me in environmental ethics, and don't, uh, and he was a philosopher. And I don't know whether somebody on the ethics side would make sense on the planning team, and uh, you know that otherwise it's too technical and legal, or whether you think otherwise. But I just taught that out that I had an entire course on environmental ethics mm -hmm. taught by a philosopher as part of a science program. So I think that's, you know, is that something that you feel like would be helpful on the planning team? Hard to right. find one of those people. It's, yeah. <laughs> those There's three or four in the state, but. <laughs> There's sometimes can, it can be a challenge to engage them. So I'm not sure if for the planning committee or probably as a stakeholder, yeah, maybe stakeholder. better. Right. 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 Um, um, Okay, emergency responders are also missing from this list, both right. on both lists. I thought we. And CW. I'll, I'll try to find. Well, if, if you could be the point contact as the KPPC representative for for emergency responders, that would be helpful. Hey, Mike, would you be willing to, to serve as the, the um, point contact for academia stakeholders? Sure. Great, Best. thank you. Um, okay. Wyatt, um, we have had such a, with every um, chemical release, you are going to experience some form of economic impact, mm -hmm. whether it's through the loss of lives or whatever it is. So I think a key stakeholder um, should be the tourism sector because mm -hmm. they're going to definitely um, suffer from it consequently. Tourism. And you're thinking just for as a stakeholder? Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully, I mean, I, I would say that the hope would be is that once we get an industry representative sitting at the table. It's hopefully a plant manager that they will serve as the as the lead for that stakeholder group, and then the same for the other 
are we is there anything missing here that we need to add and we can this can we can keep thinking through this this doesn't have to be the final list yes I think it's a good start yeah. so let's let's move on to identifying some resources that we have available to us to assist in this process um, I like to point out there there I have some literature here that, that applies and some that does not but um, this is this is for me been a valuable resource this report is called who's in danger race poverty and chemical disasters there's actually a more detailed report and I, I, I will print it off I'll print off the West Virginia component that highlights highly hazardous facilities in West Virginia the um, the risk zones the, the it gives the area around the particular facilities that are at risk um, so this has been a valuable report I only have a few copies here it is available online but if you feel like this would be extremely valuable to have a hard copy it's here and I can probably get more um, this is a, a compilation of um, it's this is a West Virginia free women and water lessons from the Elk River chemical spill some of you have seen this report but this is a report that I worked to compile after the chemical spill with um, with women mostly women there were a couple of men that participated as well but this is just hearing what the concerns were and uh, recommendations for what they would like to see moving forward to me those are two resources that are available and there are some copies there if anyone wants it what are some of our other resources that are available to us to assist in this process all the models that we've spoken about constitute cool geons and stack so the model, so we have the Contra Costa County. And then New Jersey. Um, the big, yeah, the New Jersey toxic release. The Jersey model. We and the European Union water framework. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an acronym for um, I, I believe it's the European Union water framework directives. Water framework, framework directives. directives. Correct. Water correct. framework. I, I may have that. Oh, cool. Okay, CW, is that a scientific technical advisory cell? Is, is there a hard copy of that? Yeah, I think I have the, I, I got the scientific advisor. I'll make copies okay. and, and bring it. And I have some. Uh, some stuff from Europe. I just finished the uh, Executive Emergency Manager Program in Emmitsburg, and we had volumes of, of material from around the world. And one of it was integrating science into emergency management. Uh, so I, I'll, I will look through my paperwork. I don't throw anything away. And That's some of it I may have electronically. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be better. Yeah. But it's on a shared site, and it only had a short period of time it was up on the shared site, but I do have hard copy we can run to a copier. That's the stack model, right? It's the stack model, it's a, it's a C. Oh. Uh, scientific advisory, uh, scientific technical advisory sale. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll look for the, the European models and for that. that. All right. I, 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 got, I killed a lot of trees to, uh, <laughs> to, to print all that. Of, uh, uh, but, well, uh, I'll look through some of that data and I make copies. Okay. So I can scan stuff like that. So if you want to share it electronically, I can take a stack a that high and load it in the scanner. I'll give you a card. I'll send it to you. Or um, what may be useful, since this is a starting group, is to consider um, probably a Dropbox or that'd be you know, great. One of those, right? Share that way sites. you can just drop it there and share it, and we can always, yeah. Okay. You, can that, 
Can we mm -hmm. run it through the, your, your right. IT folks here? I'm sorry. Can you run it through your IT folks here? Oh, maybe I can as a host? Drop box for you if you'd like. As much as I'm over here, I might as well just get a computer. We'll add it to this server. You can have ours. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, yeah, so if you want to utilize that, we can set it up for you. All right. Are there any other? I've got information on the Contra Costa model, and I am happy to, to share that, and we'll be doing more of that later. I'm more familiar with that model than I am the New Jersey model. Does anybody have any information on that? And I, I think we need to have, on all of them, mm -hmm. there's a fair and balanced thing. And, and one of the things I look at from the scientific side is, it, is it, can you replicate it? Is, it? is it just an opinion, or is it... Uh, as Joe Friday would say, just the facts. Uh, I, I want to look at make sure we're fair and balanced because I said there's two sides to every every argument, yeah, right. and there's some people who are going to say that this is my model and it's the greatest model ever was, and it makes the sun come up in the morning and the moon set and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and you talk to the next person, and they think it's terrible. And so it'd be nice to for like Contra Costa to have some contacts out there. And, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah, from, from, and you have your stakeholders list, it'd be nice for, for, like for me, to talk to the stakeholders there and say, how does this help you respond? Well, right. I'm glad you bring that up because in January, um, we'll get to this in a minute when we go over the meeting calendar, but I would like to invite Randy Sawyer, who is the lead of, he oversees the, the Contra Costa Industrial Safety Ordinance. That's the name of the model. I'd like to invite him here to come and speak with us um, and, and also to hear from um, I know that there are some community folks out there who experience it from that side, and then also um, to hear from industry what they think about the program. Yeah, it, it gives us a balanced report. Right. Because all of those voices are, are I mean, we have them listed on our stakeholders. Those are all, so um, I, I agree with that. I say there are multiple sides, not just two sides. <laughs> there's about oh, yeah, 10 million different there's, 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 sides. <laughs> and for example, uh, if I may digress for a second, the water crisis. Uh, we heard 70% of the people heard about it through the media, and it's almost not like a bad thing. It was a good thing because that means 70% got it how they're supposed to get it. That's, that's a big part of it. But if you looked at how many people ran to the, the store to get water moments after it was announced, it worked pretty well. You know, it worked real well. But then you ask somebody else, well, I didn't know about it for days. Nobody told me. Uh, so. Where, where's the real truth lie in there? You know, right. where, how effective were we really? And it's like anything else, you want to hear, hear all sides of it right. uh, and right. get a balanced report. Right, right. and that's so you can um, put, you know, use science to drive your decision and data because essentially you're having the subgroup that you're saying, oh, I never heard about it. I know we had a lady when we were doing a survey and she was just like, what? Do they have a chemical spill? And this was like weeks later. And she hadn't come outside at all, so she wasn't really quite aware. So, you know, there's this group, that group. So in the end, to get a balance and put it to make it a practical, something more practical that can actually serve as a reality for, you know, the community. Makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I, I was at a, I was a chemical facility to mm -hmm. represent here. I was in a facility one day, and the employee had made a mistake and did the wrong thing and caused a lot of damage. He said, nobody ever taught me. And they had documentation two hours before the incident, he'd had four hours of training. Oh, two hours. But nobody ever taught me. So that, that's, you know, it goes right. back to that fair and balanced and documentation. It'd uh, be nice to get some statistical data, mm -hmm. uh, uh, numbers of incidents, right. uh, public, well, public input, public uh, impact, and all that. Mm -hmm. I, I think I know it from the top of my head that I wouldn't guarantee that. You know, start looking at. So. <laughs> I just, I'm, we're, we're running low on time. We got a couple more things I want to get through. So I think this is a good, this will also be an ongoing list, right? Right. Um, but I think that we can all agree we want it to be fair and balanced. We want to have scientific data. We want to have experience represented, statistical um, data. It's already up here. So we just want it to be fair and balanced. I think we can agree. What do we feel like we need right now that we don't have? Is there anything? Just plant managers. Plant managers. Or, or reps. Or, or, or reps. Probably yeah. Industry. Yeah. Right. Industry. Probably industry representative. 
Yeah. And um, the, the invitations that I extended, they were specific to the plant manager or a designee. So just so you know. And uh, what would be good also probably to bring perspective to what we're doing is probably a person who's retired from one of these major industry mm -hmm. is they have a lot of information that they can bring to the table. Are there any other like specific reports, documentation, or any of these other kinds of the health department or maybe the local health department? Uh, you, you guys did a survey. Is that available? A, a survey of the impacts on the community? We did, and that's available. That is available to Mr. Asper. I'm sorry. Unless you the, the the ASPER surveys you did on the impacts? Correct. Yeah. CASPER? The CASPER, correct. Or there's another acronym. Another acronym. And, <laughs> and probably around December, we anticipate coming out with the joint um, release for the AR report, Lesson Learned, from the Harvard study. So that may be a useful tool to use. From the health studies? Um, in terms of the report we had the gathering with um, Dr. Stolder from Georgetown and Harvard. We're working on a report for that to be available probably by late December. All right. And um, we have the we have the Casper that we did, and the one done by CDC. And then Casper. Right. Mm -hmm. Pam, I know that there are some old, like audit type reports. Do you think that those would be helpful in this process? When you say audit type um, reports. I'm thinking of there was one called like the Good Neighbor Project or something. Oh yeah, um, Good Neighbor Project was with people concerned about MIC, and but that was a lot of that was mostly on on MIC. Was it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I don't know if it would be, since, since it, that's no longer. Well, it, it did have recommendations in it, which was like having, uh, reducing the amount of hazardous chemicals. It was specifically about reducing MIC, but reducing hazardous <coughs> chemicals. You kind of narrow focus, though, on that MIC. Yeah. It was the point now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, are there other, any other, yeah, I wonder, it might be good to look back at it and see if there is anything. The risk assessment principles would be the same if you change the name of the chemical. You just right. got to put in the new risk. Right. I mean, the new uh, but, but toxicity. If, if you ask me about uh, a chemical, my concern about uh, methyl ethyl, whatever it is, uh, it's and I, there's nobody been hurt by it versus MIC, which is threat from you know its history from India. Uh, I'm gonna have a different perception. And a lot, of, and a lot, and we so, start talking to the public, and, and, and all of us, all of us, we go by our perceptions. So if you ask me a perception about a particular chemical, I don't think it'd be relevant to uh, all chemicals, because we might have a, a very big fear of a particular chemical that's no longer here anymore. That that issue is moot now. Let's we're running low on time, so I just I want to move this this forward. Um, let's look at our time. Sort of jumping, jumping around on this list, but I just there are some things that I want to make sure that we get before we invite some public comment. Um, our meeting timeline. This is on the back of one of the pieces of paper in your packet. I know that. Um, I know that the Public Water Commission is meeting monthly. They're looking at what we're doing and would like updates on what we're doing. So the attempt was to try to schedule it prior to their meeting so that they can do whatever they need to do. So if there aren't any clear areas of focus, then maybe that we can kind of pick up our next meeting with some, some clear areas of focus. And, Maybe in the meantime, I'll try to provide some structure around that to help facilitate that process a bit. Um, 
in the meantime, um, I feel like there, we said that there were some, clearly some people that needed to be at the table that aren't. And um, I'm curious to know if anybody here at the table will be interested in also reaching out to our industry partners. Bill? Okay. Thank you very much. Who are some of the other folks that aren't here? <coughs> Trying to gauge what that is so that this team can can assess that. Um, employees, plant employees, industry employees. Does anybody? Would the Chemical Alliance Zone be something that would be on that list? I think it's a good idea. The reason I thought that is because Laura McCullough would be the person to reach out to the chemical industry most, in my opinion, to even more than me in terms of finding out, you know, what their hesitation is. And but Chamber that's, of Commerce also. Mm -hmm. And that's her connection. For businesses. Or I might ask Laura to do it because she might be able to do it better than I, but okay. we'll, we'll work with you on that. Okay. And Laura is with... Laura is McCullough at the college. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. The vice president of workforce. Oh, okay. So she's the one that hobnobs with the chemical industry. Okay. In order to know what kinds of workers they need. Okay. So she's our connection. <coughs> Um, I've reached out again to the AFL-CIO and I'm hoping that we'll have a representative at the next meeting. I'll, I'll follow up with them, but if anybody else wants to follow up, I feel like that's helpful. State Homeland Secure, well, we've said Chamber of Commerce. CW, do you know anybody specifically over there? To Not specifically. Uh, just talk to one of the Charleston Area Alliance or one of those uh, business groups. Uh, yeah, and should the Charleston Area Alliance be in our list? Yeah, I get emails from them all the time. And are those representing different? So one of the things that I, I think about the planning team is that there are multiple people who yeah. should be at the table, right? Yeah. So just making C sure that Cullen Namoff at the at the Charleston Area Alliance would be a good person to ask who should be involved. Okay. You know, who who at the Chamber of Commerce, for instance. Okay. She'd be a good person to give you names. And I'm happy to reach out unless anybody else wants to. All right. Department of Homeland Security, does anybody else want to reach out to them? I'm also happy to. Yeah, we can reach out to them. You can? Okay, great. They the primary, after the event happened, the water crises, were they the primary ones in charge? Like, the governor's office has a team, and they got home around the security. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty much are, yeah. Was it pretty clear who would be in charge? Of, of what? Of the water uh, spill. Water crisis? Water crisis, water crisis. Yeah. I think the governor took the lead the first thing. The governor took the lead and first first directed who was going to be involved. So what, how to move forward, getting people to the table. And is there anything else that you all have that you'd like to think about before we, before we close? So I would just invite you, I think that the surveys might, might also be helpful in thinking about moving forward what what things need to be considered or discussed in some of our future meetings so if you will please fill those out um, if you don't fill it out here I can send out a survey monkey if you would prefer yeah, if you don't have time that'd be great. That'd be great. okay yeah. I'll send that out but please please please
complete them so that we can help think about the next meeting, which will be November 14th. I'm going to see if this room is available, but I will follow up and confirm with you if so. All right. Thank you all very much for coming and spending your time today. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay. Please take donuts with you. <laughs> and coffee. It might be cold though.